Back in 2019, right at the beginning of COVID, I became quite isolated from family and friends. It suited me at the beginning, but little did I know that my curiosity would forever scar me mentally. I would often upload YouTube videos of myself browsing the dark web for fun. And until December 4th of this year, as usual, I'd have a brief run through user-submitted links to make sure everything was okay for YouTube and its rules. I must have been about 45 links down when I clicked it. The link opened a new tab, and a video began to play. I could see one person lying on a bed and another one hooded and masked, standing over the top of him on the right side of the bed. And that's when he proceeded to stab the person laying down over and over again. At first, it didn't really faze me. I've seen videos like this before, I thought, until the person finished stabbing the body got up, and then began to cut through the meat around the arms and legs, the bed now covered in blood, and the hooded masked man showing each body part to the camera. I sat through the first seven minutes thinking to myself, this is a disturbing video to say the least, until I realized that it wasn't just a pre-recorded video, it was actually a live stream, and just as the masked man finished his work, he stopped and walked towards the camera, reaching into his pocket and placing it directly in front of the camera. You're next. The panic set in, and I jumped back from my laptop. That's when I realized my camera was on. The screen went black, and my name, address, and telephone number in big white letters flashed on the screen. I quickly pressed the power button, but it did nothing. I slammed my laptop shut, turned it over, and ripped the battery out. In my panic, I actually destroyed the laptop, which was stupid but I wanted that to be the end of it. A few weeks had gone by, and even though I was paranoid beyond belief, I thought it was probably just someone messing around. I was headed out to the shop just down the road when I bumped into someone. I felt a sharp prick on my hand as we collided, thinking nothing of it. I continued towards the shop until my legs began to buckle from under me. I knew what had happened. I'd been spiked when we bumped into each other. Everything around me started to go black. I tried fighting the drug, but the drug finally took over and I collapsed in the street. I thought I was done for until I woke up in the hospital a few hours later, dazed and confused. Panic set in, and the doctors had to restrain me until I calmed down. They told me I'd been given some drug to knock me out and proceeded to give me my stuff back. There was a note that read, Never come back to the dark web. This is your one and only warning. Ever since that day, I've stayed clear of the dark web. But even now, I still feel as though I'm being watched. I had always been aware of the deep web. You hear the craziest, most fucked up stories from people who have the balls to explore it. Websites that involve human experimentation, hiring a hitman, and even watching people through their own security cameras. It's fucked up. But honestly, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't just slightly interested. Now, just to point out, there was no malicious intent behind my exploration of the deep web. I was just curious to see if it really was as bad as people said it was. The first thing I stumbled upon was a website extremely centered around death, which gave me a really uneasy feeling, so I didn't hang around that web page very long. It takes quite a bit to freak me out, so it's safe to say I was a little surprised that I couldn't even stomach the first website I clicked on. But, hey, it's not supposed to be all unicorns and rainbows, right? Next, I clicked a website that was dedicated to watching people through security cameras. Most of the screens showed empty living rooms and patios. Some of them showed oddly filled rooms, like rooms that were packed with stuffed animals, and another that was eerily decorated with fucking Christmas lights and fake Santa Claus statues. Another screen showed a young woman doing yoga. That one had a lot of views. I didn't watch that one very long. Something inside me felt ill and just... wrong like what I was doing what's sickening. I shook my head, blinking away any more curiosity before I hovered my mouse over the tiny axe to close the window. Right before I pressed the mouse, I saw a blue link under a black screen that said, proceed with caution. I bit down on my back teeth, yelling internally to leave the page. Don't click the link, it's not worth it. It could be murder. Would that make me an accomplice? What if it was someone skinning an animal or some shit like that? But then again, what if it wasn't? I don't know what the hell propelled me to move my mouse away from the window, hovering it over the link instead. But that's where I ended up. My curiosity always got the best of me, and no matter how twisted my stomach felt or how strong the feeling of dread was that lingered right over my head, I had to know. I really just had to know what the link led to, 
or I would go crazy until I finally figured it out. So I pressed my mouse down and watched the link turn purple, felt my mouth go dry, and watched as the screen slowly loaded. The page was just compromised of a large screen like the security camera page, only it was just one. The room was concrete. It was dark. There must have been a night vision camera or something because everything had a weird blue-green tinge, but you could tell there was little to no light. There was a dark liquid on the floor in a medium-sized puddle. I told myself it was gasoline. Don't ask me why. Movement in the far right of the screen caught my attention, and I immediately perked in my desk chair, inching my face closer to the screen of my laptop. It looked like an arm, like someone's forearm. They were standing there, not really moving, but subtly swaying, just enough to not look completely still. Hey, I said before shaking my head and slapping my mouth shut. Stupid. Then the person walked. They walked over towards the left of the screen. I felt my stomach knot, felt my throat tingle and tighten, bile rising in the back of my throat. I knew my mouth was open, gaping, and my eyes were wide, face screwed up into an expression of pure disgust. It was a young woman. She looked like she couldn't be older than 25 or so. Long, dark, and dirty hair was in tangles like she'd been pulling at it. Her leg was dragging, her other skinny leg doing most of the work as she limped weakly. Her head was down, looking at the floor, and the sound of her dragging her foot across the concrete echoed in my silent room. I didn't think it could get any worse. I was so, so fucking wrong. Suddenly, the woman raised her head, and it looked like it weighed a ton on her tiny body. I hadn't noticed it before, only able to barely make out her side profile. But now it was clear as day. She looked around, eyes watering with tears and black makeup streaming down her face. Small strands of bloody thread were intertwined in her lips, messily tied, locking them together. Dark blood stained her chin, probably from where she'd tried desperately to open her mouth, to scream before realizing she couldn't. Her dainty fingers were stained as well, the same color as the puddle on the concrete. My whole body felt weak. My stomach was sick. I tried to tell myself it was fake, that it was all a big hoax. My eyes scanned to the bottom left of the screen. 5,623. 5,623 people were watching. Unable to fight it any longer, I ran straight into the bathroom, puking my insides into the toilet bowl. Everything in me felt disgusting, wrong, twisted. Once I was finally done, I laid on the floor of the bathroom, letting the cool tiles try to soothe my burning body. My head was spinning. I kept repeating to myself, over and over in my head, that I shouldn't have clicked the link. I should have left. I should have closed the fucking window and told my inner curiosity to go fuck itself. Instead, I was laying on the floor, the bathroom reeking of vomit, and my mind a complete mess over that the hell I was supposed to do. Should I get the link and send it to the police? Should I call them now? My first instinct was to copy and paste the link just in case, then call the police and inform them of what was happening. Maybe they could trace the IP address or something. Maybe they would recognize the girl and know where to start looking. Maybe I could save her life. I'd feel really fucking dumb if this was all fake just to get viewers, but I wasn't about to gamble. Not with what was at stake. I ignored the dizzy feeling flooding my head as I jumped up, grabbing the doorknob and twisting it a bit too harshly. When I flung the door open, my phone buzzed in my pocket, scaring the living shit out of me. I stopped mid-panic and picked it up with shaky hands. I saw my girlfriend's name and immediately slid to answer. My voice was a complete wreck, my eyes finding the screen where the girl shrunk down to the ground, the sound of her cries bouncing around the room, making my body feel rigid. I had nothing left to throw up, but I still felt so sick. Madeline, you're not going to believe what I just fucking saw. What? You, are you okay? Have you been crying? No, I'm not okay, I answered, averting my eyes from the screen. I know you said to stay away from the deep web, but are you kidding me? Her voice went from caring to mad in a split second. I told you to stay away from that place. You never listen to me. You never fucking do. There's a girl, I said weakly. She's trapped in some basement or something. Her mouth is, she's, her mouth is like, sewn shut. There's blood all over her face and hands. I don't know what to do, Madeline. The woman's cries got louder, more desperate, but muffled. I'm so sorry. Close it out, clear your history, and never go back there again. I'm not kidding. But should I call? 
No. Her voice was stern now. You don't know if it's bullshit. It's probably staged to gain disgusting viewers, apparently like yourself. People do it all the time. That's why I said it'd be best if you just stayed away from there. You could get yourself into a lot of trouble. I didn't say anything, wordlessly walking over to the desk. My hands shook as I raised my mouse to the smallix once more. My eyes watched the number of viewers slowly tick higher and higher before I closed the window. I felt even worse than before. Okay. We can file a report tomorrow, just in case, but for now, go to sleep and stay the fuck away. I can't believe you even went there in the first place. I didn't have the energy to argue with her. Guilt plagued my whole body, drowning me. It was all I could feel. I told her goodnight, that I was sorry, and that I loved her before I hung up and made my way to the couch to sleep, or try to sleep. It didn't feel right even being in my bedroom or being anywhere near my computer. Not while that girl was still trapped, unable to scream for help, unable to talk at all. I know it could be fake, but was that really a risk I was willing to take? I looked up some Google searches over what was fake on the deep web and read multiple stories about staged webcam videos, which made me feel a little bit better. It didn't make the sick, guilty feeling go away, though. It's safe to say that I didn't get much sleep. Every time I closed my eyes or even began to drift off, I would see the woman's face. The thread laced into her lips, the blood staining her mouth, her fingers, the floor. I continued to grow more and more anxious and uneasy, deciding that maybe getting out of the house, heading over to the local CVS and picking up some melatonin might help. I threw my blanket off, slid on my shoes, and grabbed my keys and wallet from the nightstand. The cool air felt amazing and did wonders to calm to whirlwind of thoughts in my head. I went to check the time, realizing I'd left my phone at home. Not a huge deal, the store was only a few minutes away from my house. I ended up buying melatonin and a stronger sleeping pill just in case those didn't work. I also got a pack of bottled water to help rehydrate after I vomited up all the contents in my stomach earlier. By the time I got home, I felt much, much better, which lasted about three seconds before I noticed that my front door was wide open. Now I may have been in a state of shock and panic, but I never, never ever leave my front door open or even unlocked. My heart immediately began to race. I got out of my car, closing the door quietly and unlocking my trunk, grabbing the crowbar that I keep in there. Who's there? I yelled into the house, waiting for any noise. Who is in there? My own voice was shaking and weak. I was met with complete silence. Keeping the crowbar up and ready to strike, I walked to the couch and felt for my phone. As soon as I found it, I hit the emergency button and waited until I got a hold of a 9-11 operator, letting her know that I think my house was just broken into. She told me police would be on their way. After checking around the house for anything odd, I decided to give my girlfriend a call, letting her know what had happened. The phone rang, rang, and then rang some more. After getting her voicemail, I hung up, knowing she'd probably be asleep this late at night. I waited about 20 or so minutes for the police to show up and walked around with them like a scared puppy as they checked every room. They ended up just having me fill out a report telling me they'll keep patrol cars in the area just in case anyone else gets hit. As they were leaving, I checked to see if Madeline had called back yet, but there wasn't any missed calls. I, however, did notice several outgoing calls to her cell phone. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.12 a.m. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.14 a.m. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.17 a.m. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.20 a.m. And then another one at 3.56 which was around the time I'd gotten home. My mind went into an automatic panic, knowing for a fact that I did not make those calls. I quickly checked my texts, reading one I'd apparently sent out at 3.23 a.m. Hey, can't sleep. Gonna come over, mind leaving the back door unlocked so I can get in? I didn't send that message. My stomach dropped. My heart thudded loudly in my chest as I noticed her reply directly underneath. Sorry, I was sleeping. Thanks for waking me up, BTW. Lose your key again? It's unlocked. Don't be too late. Without a second thought, I jumped up, running to lock all the doors and windows in my house, keeping the crowbar tight in my hand as I ran to my car. I drove as fast as my little Civic would allow, all the way to her house, ignoring any stoplights. It only took me three minutes to get there, but I still knew it'd be too late. I made my way to her back door, feeling every cell in my body burn when I saw it was wide open. My face was hot, my hands were shaking, but I stepped in, 
crowbar raised like a bat ready to swing. I tried to keep my emotions at bay as I looked around her dark house. Madeline? I called out. Are you okay, babe? Nothing. Silence. Madeline? A small scream came from her bedroom just up the stairs. My legs jerked to a run as I flew up the stairs, slamming her door open. I looked at her empty bed, her empty room. Confused, I heard the scream again. Only this time, I heard that it was coming through her computer monitor. I felt numb as I looked at the screen, noticing the same website I saw earlier. Only instead of one woman, I saw two. The first was lying on the floor, not moving in that puddle of dark liquid. I recognized the second girl just as I had recognized her voice. My heart shattered as I saw her face streaked in blood. The same threading was sewn into her eyelids, locking them shut. Her scream hit my bones, surrounded my body. It was all I could hear. Her face was twisted in pure terror. I cried pathetically as her voice began to go out, continuing to grow weaker and rasped. I locked my jaw, picking up my cell and dialing nine, eleven for the second time. Only this time it barely rang once before the deep, gravelly voice of another man answered. You should not have called. Chills shot down my body and I heard the phone thud as it hit the carpeted floor. My breath hitched in my throat as I bent to pick it up, hanging up the call and racing down the stairs. How did he do that? How did he redirect my call away from the police? I felt my heart race as I darted out of her back door in a frenzy as I sprinted to the closest house. I pounded the door, screaming at the top of my lungs until the neighbor opened it, her face tired, confused and scared. She let me in, and I explained through frantic tears what happened. I'm typing this on my phone to post as we both try to get a hold of the cops, but neither of our calls are going through, and neither is her landline. I think someone is messing with our cellular signal, and they may have cut her line, but we're going to keep trying. I'm scared for me, I'm scared for my girlfriend, and I'm scared for my neighbor. I don't know what's going to happen to me. If you don't hear from me again, please take this advice and this experience to heart. Stay away from the deep web. For fuck's sake, please, please stay away from the deep web. I've never been one of those people fascinated by the dark web. As a 16-year-old girl in high school, I had much better things to do. I'd prefer to hang out with my friends and get my nails done than spend all my time on the internet searching for this dark web. One day at school, though, my friend Kelly was telling me about how her boyfriend was dared to go on the dark web. There is some weird stuff on there. He said it was really creepy with videos of cults and sacrifices. Kelly said, Why would someone even want to see that stuff? It's disgusting, I said. Yeah, I wouldn't, that's for sure, Kelly said. At lunch that day, all my friends were talking about Robbie's dare and how one of us should do the dare. I didn't say anything as I did not want to even think about having to go on the dark web. Rape, killers, weapons. I knew what was on the dark web and I wanted none of it. Hey guys, maybe Charlotte should do the dare, my other friend Christine said. Heck no guys, I'm not going on that creepy website, I said quickly. They all started chanted now, do it, do it, do it, do it. People were starting to stare as I turned red. Finally, after more people started to join in, I gave up. Fine, I'll go on that stupid website, I screamed. They all started to cheer with Kelly saying, Okay, but just to make sure you do, you have to FaceTime me while you're going on. And don't worry, I'll have Robbie send you a link, she said with a smile. I was furious with them but didn't say anything. Who cares? I'll just close my eyes when I see anything bad they didn't say I had to look, I thought. That night, I got a text from Robbie giving me a link to a website. He also said in the text, good luck. I got goosebumps reading it, but I wasn't going to chicken out as I knew my friends would never let me forget it. I FaceTimed Kelly as I was loading the link onto my computer saying, this is so stupid. Can't believe I let you guys talk me into it. Oh, don't be like that. How about this? You only have to click on one site on the web and that's it. I'll tell everyone you went on and we'll all have a good laugh, Kelly said on the phone. The link loaded and I was taken to a black screen with a skull in the middle and a whole bunch of links all in red. I gulped as I decided to click on the third link. I was taken to some kind of an auctioning website. It didn't seem bad at first, but then I read the auctions. The auctions had female names attached to them with a link. I clicked on a random link which had a picture taken from a car of a girl walking home from school. She looked about my age with dark brown hair and green eyes. It had a description underneath that said, Tiffany Smith. Age 16, high school, Adelante High, parents, Martha and Gordon Smith. 
Hair color, brown, eyes green. Body description, small but packaged with good sized breasts and small waist. Price, 20,000. What do you see? Kelly said on the phone. It, it's some kind of sick auction where they're selling girls, I said in a shaky voice. Are you serious? Call the police right now, she screamed on the phone. As I was about to hang up the call and dial 911, I froze as I saw a name on the top of the list. Charlotte Miller. I freaked out and started to cry. I don't know why I did, but I clicked on the link next to my name. The picture was also taken from a car of me walking home from school. The description said, Charlotte Miller, age 16, high school, Spring Hill High, parents Cindy and Harry Miller, hair color, blonde, eyes brown, body description, excellent body with curvy hips and great sized breasts. Price, 60,000. I screamed and started to cry. Kelly tried to talk to me, but I couldn't hear her. I hung up the phone and ran to my parents' room. They heard me and ran out of their room before I could even come in. I told my dad about the website which he and my mom checked on. They called the police shortly after. After looking at the website also, they said there was nothing they could do. The link was untraceable, so they couldn't figure out where the website came from. They said they would keep an officer nearby watching my house in case someone came. After that, they left. I slept in my parents' room that night. I didn't get any sleep as the image of me walking home from school and the description of me were all burnt into my mind. How did they know all this? Were they going to come for me? I thought the whole night. I told Kelly and my friends everything that happened as they all listened in shock. They apologized for making me go on the website and said that we should all hang out after and go shopping to get my mind off what happened. I agreed as we made plans to meet at the mall at four. I asked Kel if she could walk home with me, but she said she was getting a ride from her mom. Panicking, I called my parents and asked if they could pick me up, but they weren't even home from work as they were stuck in traffic. I somehow got the courage to walk home by myself as I started walking to my house. You'll be okay. You're only 15 minutes away from your house and it's the afternoon. Now one is going to do anything with people around. I thought to myself as I walked. As I walked though, I could see out of the corner of my eye a man walking behind me fast. I started to speed up my walking, but he followed and got faster as well. I freaked out and started to run and didn't look back. I ran all the way to my house as I fumbled for the keys to the front door. Just as I was about to put the key in, I felt a prick in my shoulder and the world faded to black. I woke up to find myself in a dark room, lit only by a computer right in front of me. In the computer, I saw that it was on a Google Meet with at least 50 people in it. When I tried to move, I found myself chained to the ground. I screamed and pleaded for help to the computer with no avail. Then as I looked in the camera, I saw a figure emerge from the shadows. He wore black jeans and a black hood. I couldn't see his face in the dark. He came up right behind me and spoke in a deep voice to the computer. How much? I saw in horror as the people in the meet started numbering off prices. 60,000, 80,000, 90,000. The biggest price came shortly after. 115,000. There were no prices named after that. The man then spoke. Going once, going twice, sold. Two days later. Kelly stares at the poster in her hand, tears in her eyes as she reads, Missing Charlotte Miller. She cries even more as she sees the smiling picture of Charlotte on the poster, looking so happy with her glistening blonde hair and brown eyes. Charlotte, I'm so sorry. 